Well, it's a pleasure to talk with you again. This is Ray Nelson, who is uh, one of the key principals in MPD Digital, and he makes coax cable assemblies. Today we're going to be talking about connectors. Uh, what about connectors gets hams confused? What do hams need to know about connectors? The biggest thing that we spend most of our time on is that connectors have different genders than you what you might expect. Hmm. And especially when you get into uh, what's known as reverse polarity connectors. Mm -hmm. um, first thing hams need to understand is if it says RP or reverse polarity, anywhere in the title, the listing, the description, um, the label, or anything else, it's not for you. Oh. <laughs> okay. That's the easiest way I know to put it. If it says reverse polarity or RP, it will not work with any ham radio equipment known to man. Uh -huh. It's all only designed for wireless internet applications. Oh, that's products. right. It's part male, part female on those things. Right. What, what the FCC and its infinite wisdom did back in the uh, back in the 1990s is they came up with and excuse me I'm trying to scrounge for an RP connector here in my in my box uh, they came up with there we go that's a good one they came up with a nice little um, ruling that the connectors had to change and I don't know if you can see the inside of that connector or not it's female. But what you okay. have what you have is you have here an SMA female with a male pin on the inside. Oh, okay. And this is called this is called an RP SMA female mm -hmm. or reverse polarity SMA female. And what that means is it has a male pin on the inside and will not interface with any ham radio SMA connector. Hmm. Will not connect to it. Because the FCC decided that because wireless internet was unique and different, that they were going to fix it so we could not use regular antennas and standard connectivity uh, for the cable assemblies or the boxes. So they had the manufacturers flip around the connector genders on the inside, not the outside, so that they didn't work. And so what happens is, of course, that in the United States, our, uh, all the wireless and Wi-Fi uses RP connectors. Uh -huh. Now, I have antennas for Wi-Fi made in Switzerland that have standard connectors on it because they thought the idea was stupid. <laughs> so, uh, so overseas, if, the, if some of them that are made overseas for European use, they still use the standard SMA connectors or TNC connectors, uh -huh. but if you're if you're looking at Cisco or Netlink or D-Link or any of the other Wi-Fi manufacturers that sell in the states, they're going to use the RP connectors, which will not work for AM radio. Huh. I cannot tell you how many hundreds and hundreds of cable assemblies we have exchanged over the years because somebody grabbed one because it looked right on the outside. <laughs> Well, now I think the connector hams are most familiar with is the good old PL two fifty nine, um, that is. and yet uh, I understand that overseas radios come equipped with uh, end connectors instead of PL two fifty nines. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, you know, most of you know some some still use PL two fifty nine, but mo in most cases these PL two fifty nine connectors that were invented back in the 30s, uh, basically, you know, for a way to connect radio systems for the wars, um, are obsolete. And about the only folks that still use them are amateur radio operators. Um, and the reason we use them is because they're easy. Mm -hmm. That anybody, anybody sitting at home with a pocket knife or a razor blade and a soldering iron can put a PL259 connector on a cable. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the good thing. The bad thing is they're not impedance matched. They're very high loss. 
If you're going to use them over 300 megahertz, you're going to have significant amounts of loss. Um, so, you know, I'd say 60 meters is about the highest you want to use them. But, um, you know, they work. Uh, but the other part of it is, is they're not waterproof. They were never designed to be waterproof or water resistant or do anything but siphon water from the outside down into the center of your coaxial cable. So if you're using them, make sure you seal those connections up. Well, now, if uh, they're so bad and obsolete, why are they still in such wide use? Because they're easy. Because people can put them on at home, and the manufacturers sell them because they always have sold them that way. Uh, there's so much, there's so many, so much cabling out there within our network that, um, you know, getting people to change over to ends is a slow process. We're seeing more and more antennas come out with end male or end female connectors on, but you're still seeing most radios come out with the PL two fifty nines instead of the ends. Or the F two thirty nines instead of the ends. Now, what are the advantages of the end connectors? Uh, why, don't, why don't you show us show us an end connector so we know sure. what we're talking about here? Sure. I mean, it's it's incompatible with the TL PL two fifty nine, right? That's correct. Yeah, the end connector is a matched connector. It is impedance matched. It's a fifty ohm connector. It's matched to your cable. If you notice, there's a, a an O-ring on the inside of it that seals it. It's a silicone O-ring that, when it's tightened down on the female, creates a waterproof barrier that it, that prevents water penetration, at least in the through the connector body itself. You still want to seal around where it's crimped because if you don't, within five to ten years, you'll start getting a little bit of water in there, but it won't leak the first rainstorm mm -hmm. uh, and it's a higher frequency connector usable just off the shelf the basic ones are good up to about six gigahertz uh, so because it's frequency matched or it because it's it's matched all the way up um, and it's perfectly usable there there's absolutely no reason not to use them whenever you possibly can um, it's a it's a very well made, very well designed connector. What are the disadvantages? Uh, it requires special tooling in order to install it. Ah. Uh, it either requires either you're going to buy crimping tools uh, to install it, or you're going to have to buy a clamp connector uh, and. Um, and use you know use a wrench and a soldering iron to put it on if you if you buy a clamp connector. Uh -huh. So you don't necessarily need a crimp tool, but you will need to use um, some type of tools to put it on. Whereas you don't have to do that with the PL259. Uh -huh. Do you see much of a movement in ham radio to go to end connectors in the United States? Yeah, we're seeing more and more of them used all the time, especially in repeaters. Mm -hmm. And you know, higher end type things where uh, where loss is critical and calculations are critical, uh, we see it with a whole lot of repeaters. I'd say the vast majority of, of uh, cables we've made for repeater installations over the last several years have been in connectors. Um, I'm seeing them a lot in diplexer and duplexer use. Um, so you're you're beginning to see a transition there. The other thing about end connectors is for the for the standard end connectors about the same cost as a PL259, but they they can get expensive because if you get up into the the higher frequency end connectors. But for our use, you know, you could buy an end connector for about the same as a PL259. Mm -hmm. So if somebody were to buy a cable assembly from you, it'd be about the same price for say putting running something to an HF beam or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, uh, in fact, we charge exactly the same to put on an end connector as we do a PL259. Mm -hmm. it, exactly the same. So if you're, especially, and I tell this to people all the time, if you're building an antenna, 
build it with an end female bulkhead or an end female connection off of it and run an end to PL259 cable. You'll have less loss, you'll have better water resistance, and your, uh, your, your, your installation will just last longer. Mm -hmm. So, um, now the other connector that's familiar to hams is the BNC. This one here. Yeah. Um, tell me about the BNC. I see them on QRP radios. They all seem to come with BNC connectors, which is a yeah. pain because I've got to get adapters for all of my antennas. And I've, I've always wondered that myself. It's kind of weird. Uh, you know, the, there were two guys in, that you know, have left a, an enduring legacy in the connector world. Uh, guys by the name of Neil and Councilman. Mm -hmm. And the end connector is named after <coughs> Mr. Neal. The NC mm -hmm. connector is named after a bayonet for the type of connection it is. Mm -hmm. And then Neil Councilman, BNC. Yeah. So um, the BNC connector has been around a long, long time. The, the biggest issue with the BNC is that it is, unlike the PL259, it's a 50 ohm matched connector and it is good up to about three gigahertz without excessive loss. Mm -hmm. So you've got a lot better uh, connectivity and a lot less loss, and it's very quick to install. I mean, it's just basically push, twist, click, and you're done. Um, the, and it works well for that. It's very, very easy to install, very easy to use. The drawback with the BNC is they have a spring in them, mm -hmm. and the main body of the BNC has a spring. I don't know if you can see me pulling here, but the way yeah. you connect the BNC is you have to pull that spring out, twist it, and let go, and the spring, and the spring snaps it in place. So there's a point of failure there, and over time you have to be careful and you have to check before you go out uh, and want to use your equipment you need to check your BNC connectors to make sure they're all still behaving themselves, that that spring's in, in place, and that they're going to go ahead and snap closed for you. Uh -huh. um, what is the power limitation? I mean, they seem a little bit fragile. Is there a power they, limitation? They are fragile, <laughs> but they'll handle legal limit. Um, they'll handle legal limit if you get the BNC with the Teflon dielectric. If you notice, there's a plastic piece on the inside of the BNC connector surrounding the center pin. Yeah. Uh, it's a white piece. Uh, quality BNCs, that's made of Teflon. Uh, the cheap Chinese BNCs, it's made of plastic. Guess what happens to the plastic one when you run a couple of thousand watts through it? <laughs> it melts and then you've got it a melts. short. Yeah, it melts and you get a short. So. Make sure that you're getting a BNC connector that's a decent one, and it'll handle legal limit without it without too much of an issue. Okay, do we need to specify that if we order cables from you, or do you automatically no, do no, that? No, no, we don't use we don't use Chinese connectors. Every every connector we have has a dielectric that's capable of handling, you know, 3,500 to 5,000 watts without an issue. Um, if you're going to go over 10,000 watts you need to tell me because then I need to upgrade to one that's made for that but if you're a ham radio operator you're not going to tell me that anyway uh, but uh, we have some folks we, we do we do work with commercial radio stations mm -hmm. and you know, they'll call me up and say okay I need a cable that'll handle 30,000 watts so we'll build one and we'll have to build one that'll handle that'll handle that amount of power going through it that's got to be a pretty thick cable it is. It's we handle. We make cable as big around as oh three, four inches. Really? Wow. Yeah. That would be yeah. kind of hard to wind on a stool uh, on a spool. It uh, the spools it comes in are about uh, three feet around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it, uh, those get <clears throat> those get heavy. You get you get one spool per pallet. <laughs> Take a little bit to ship out. Now, the yeah. other connector I've seen in the ham radio is the SMA. Right. Um, which you were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. 
And the SMA is on things like uh, software-defined radios and so on. Right. Uh, see them on uh, particularly low-power devices. What is the big deal about the SMA? I don't think I've even seen one until in the last several years. Yeah, there's two things about the SMA. Number one, they're small. You can fit a lot of SMA connectors or a lot of SMA connections on a single small box. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the way that when somebody calls me up and starts at asking what kind of connector they need, I say, okay, get out a ruler to, uh, and measure across the face of the connector. Is it three quarters of an inch, half an inch, or a quarter inch? If it's three quarters of an inch, it's either a PL259 or an N. If it's half an inch, it's either a BNC or a TNC. And if it's a quarter inch, it's an SMA or an FME or something along that line. So uh, the SMA connectors are a lot smaller. The second thing is, is they're a low-loss, high-frequency connector. They were designed to work with higher frequencies, um, and they're designed to be able to, to carry a signal with with low loss and mm -hmm. um, it works out quite well when you're when you need to run a smaller cable or you need to run uh, you know to equipment that requires you know more fidelity and, and a better signal better signal propagation now are the SMA connectors something a ham could put on themselves or does this require special equipment all the all the connectors can be put on by anybody if you just have the right crimping tool. And, and the way to look at it is, is that every connector type for a specific cable type uses the same crimping tool and dies. Uh -huh. In other words, if you're going to have, if you're going to put connectors on RG213, the crimping tool for RG213 will put on crimp, two P, crimp PL259s, ends, BNCs, TNCs, SMAs, it'll put on the connectors to fit that size cable. Mm -hmm. So it, it makes it simple in that, you know, you've got one tool to put on any connector to fit a specific cable size. And where it gets complicated is, is that, of course, for RG58, there's a different crimping die, and for LMR240 or RG8X, there's a different crimping die. And then for RG213 LMR400, there's a different crimping die. And there's really a di RG223, there's a different crimping die. So there's really a different die out there for every major cable type. Mm -hmm. uh, and it can get expensive after a while because if you want to, let's say as a ham, if you want to be able to put crimp connectors on three different cables, RG58, RG8X, RG213, you need either three crimpers or one crimper and three dies to mm -hmm. get, let you crimp the connectors you know, for three different sizes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, we've been over the common connectors. What are the sleepers? What are the other connectors ham radio operators ought to know about? Uh, the other ones that you want to know about are the TNCs the male and female TNC connectors, because you'll see those every now and then. Those are another, th think of them as, as kind of like an end connector, but a little bit smaller. Uh -huh. uh, they're actually a threaded version of the BNC connector. Mm. They're the same size connector invented by the same people, but they found out that in field use and in, in tough use, the, the BNC, the springs were breaking, and that the BNCs weren't extremely robust. So they invented one like the end connector with a lot of threads on it so that when you take these two and thread them together, what you end up with is you end up with a connection that's both waterproof and that absolutely is going to be very, very strong. Mm -hmm. And unlike the BNC connection, you've got one that, that's, not going to, that's going to put up with a lot of abuse. So they're just as strong as the end connectors, but they're a quarter inch smaller in size. They're only a half inch across uh -huh. the base of them. Uh, the other connector that you run into all the time, of course, when you're doing 75 ohm work, is the F connector. Mm -hmm. And you can get them with or without 
uh, with or without the protective rubber gaskets for outside use. But the F connector is the standard connector for 75 ohm cable, just like the coax, just like the cable companies you use to run into your house. Yeah. Uh, and you know those will, you know, lots of folks are using 75 ohm cable for matching and other things. And of course, a PL259 can also be used on 75 ohm, just like it can 50 ohm. Remember, it's not impedance matched, so it doesn't matter. The PL259 doesn't care what cable type you put it on because it's not matched to any cable. So you mm -hmm. can use it on 75 ohm, 90 ohm, 50 ohm. The PL259 doesn't care. So uh, neither does the SO239. So mm -hmm. that's you know that's another aspect of that. So. If you're hooking up 75 ohm cable, sometimes you can do a better connection by using an unmatched connector like the PL. Mm -hmm. And then there's there's other connectors that you get into for satellite radio use, like FMEs and SMBs, and you know, we you know, we stock 144 different connector types, and if you look at it, there are. There's thousands out there. Um, we just did a cable for a company up in Massachusetts that had a TNC connector on one end and an N connector on the other. Perfectly normal. Except each connector was left-hand threaded. Really? So it was, it was a proprietary setup from a specific manufacturer that in order to force people to buy their stuff had left-hand threaded all the connectors so that had to be screwed onto the equipment turning to the left instead of turning to the right. Oh my goodness. And unless you had left hand threads, it would not work. So yeah. we had to build the cable with left hand threads. And you found the connectors to do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Same cable, same antennas, same cable, but they but they put left hand threads on everything. Mm -hmm. And what that does is you take a uh, you take a $3 connector and a $30 cable and you turn it into a $150 cable because it's got <laughs> left-handed threads on it. <laughs> Manufacturers do some do some fun things sometimes. Oh, any way to keep a customer. That's yeah. it. Now, um, the one last connector I thought was of interest is the phono connector. Um, mm -hmm. You made a special cable for me that was a phono connector on one end, so I could plug it into the RF out on the back of my Yesu. Uh huh. The standard R, the standard RCA connector, <clears throat> the oldie but goodie. <clears throat> yeah. You don't see and them much more, but I remember my Heathkit HW16 was built with a phono connector. I've got a, uh, I've got an old, actually, I've got two older amps that uh, use PL259 to RCA connectors or phono connectors to move the signal from the radio to the amplifier. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the reason we actually went to, we actually went to uh, our manufacturer for connectors and had them make the RCA phono connectors specifically for us for RF use. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the ones that you see today are kind of flimsy because they're only made for audio, like plugging in phonographs and radio and stereos and stuff like that. Right. So we actually had them go make a more robust one, like the one we sent you, that would handle a couple of thousand, three thousand, five, you know, that would handle legal limit power. Um, because the last thing I wanted to do was put a connector on an amplifier that wasn't going to handle the power going back to the radio. Right. So, um, any last thoughts on connectors that you'd like to tell our audience today? Yeah, connectors can be as important as the cable itself. And the reason for that is simple. Um, there are good connectors and bad connectors out there. Uh, I could buy PL259 connectors from China for a quarter a piece and sell them for $253 just like we sell ours for right now. Or I can buy a connector for a dollar fifty, two dollars a piece and sell them for $250. And the difference is in material. Uh, it has to do with the amount of brass in the connector. The heavier, the, the heaviest plating that you need, or the type of plating that's required, 
and the robustness of the connector itself. Uh, unfortunately, what we're seeing is as copper becomes more expensive, uh, we're seeing more tin used in the alloy, alloy and we get bronze instead of you know, brass connectors. Uh, we're seeing, um, you know, we're seeing a lot more kind of bad connectors being manufactured because it's easier and cheaper to make them and they can sell them for the same price. Mm -hmm. So understand, be careful out there. Always ask if the center conductor and the dielectric in your connector is Teflon. Always ask, you know, is it will it hold up to being soldered? Because I don't know how many people I know have gotten the less expensive uh, crimp, the less expensive PL two fifty nines with the real, with the with the thin. Uh, of course, I can't grab. I'm, I'm holding like fifty different types of connectors, and I can't find the one I want to show you. But that's normal. But uh, there are people out there that have soldered on a PL two fifty nine and seen the pin go as it as it melts. Oh, gee. Um, and that's mainly because they use plastic rather than Teflon for the insulation dielectric in it. You know that body that body on the inside of that PL two fifty nine that holds that pin in place. If that's not made of Teflon or something else that will take that heat, that pin's going to go crooked. And, and the, the plastic will actually melt, and you'll end up with a bad connection. So make sure you ask before you buy connectors, you know, are, are these using Teflon? Are these, you know, are these brass? Uh, don't buy the ones made out of aluminum um, because you can actually find those now. Uh, so that, that's mainly it. Just, just pay attention to what you're buying because the quality only costs a little bit more, and it will last a whole lot longer. Mm -hmm. Oh, and one more thing. One thing about connectors out there that people, silver. Oh, it's silver can plated, you, yes. Yeah, can you see the difference between these three connectors here? There's, there's, the one in the center is nickel plated. The two on the outside are silver plated. Uh -huh. And I don't know if you can see it on this little computer screen, but these, this one here and this one here are almost golden in color. Um, and this one in the center is still bright and shiny because it's nickel plated. Yeah. The plating on the exterior of the connector, uh, if it's silver, is going to tarnish yeah. as is exposed to the elements. Um, one of the unique properties about silver is that the tarnish is just about as electrically conductive as silver itself. Mm -hmm. It's the only element out there, the only metal out there that the corrosion, the tarnish, is electrically conductive to the point that it's useful. Um, copper doesn't work that way. When copper turns green, that vertigris on the outside is no longer good for any type of conduction. But mm -hmm. the silver is a different thing. And then, of course, gold doesn't Gold doesn't tarnish enough to, make, to even to even talk about, but silver is a little bit different. So if you've got a silver conduct, conductor that's tarnished, if you want to clean it, fine, but you don't really need to. It'll still work just fine. Um, the other thing is, is what we're going to now on our next batch of conduct, our next batch batch of PL two fifty nines, is we're going to a a silver body like we've always used for ease of soldering and ease of connection. Yeah. And the outside shell is actually going to be an anodized hard nickel plating on the brass. Mm -hmm. um, and we're doing that for two reasons. One, we've actually had people return things because they tarnish and they didn't like the fact that they were turning black. Uh, and, uh, and secondly, because spending the extra money these days on silver for the outside shell doesn't really make sense when it doesn't do anything for your signal. Yeah. Um, because all of the electricity, all of the signals conducted down the center part of a PL259, the outside shell is just the shielding and that holds it onto the radio itself. You're not, right. you know, you're not getting anything on that outside there. You're not, you know, there's no reason to silver plate that. So we're actually moving from a silver plated outside shell uh, to a uh, nickel. The inside of the shell and the the connector 
uh, the center conductor and the connector itself will still be silver plated, but we're going to save a little bit of money by going to nickel on the outside. Uh, Got to figure out ways to economize with the price of silver going up. Yeah, the price of copper is going up too. I understand. Price of copper is going up. Time, you know, we're Times Microwave Distributor. Times has raised its cost by about ten percent. Um, we, you know, we had to raise prices because of that. Um, if you, anybody that's bought from us off of Amazon or Walmart uh, has seen our prices go up significantly, um, you might want to take a look at USA Coax uh, because there we've been able to keep the prices down. Uh, but the the fact of the matter is is that yeah, the economy is heating up, more things are getting built and more people have jobs. Uh, the flip side of that is more people are buying copper and as demand rises, so do prices. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, we appreciate your time today very much and thank you very much for educating uh, the, the Augies that we have, our uh, uh, followers of OG, and uh, look forward to talking with you next time. Love it, enjoy it, thank you much, Dave. And there you have it, another conversation with Ray Nelson of MPD Digital about coax and connectors. It's always entertaining and informative to talk with him, and we will do so again. In channel news, please be sure to check uh, www.dkessler.com support for ways that you can make this a viewer-supported channel. And please ask questions, and you can send the questions to Ham Radio Answers at gmail.com, or you can go to www.dcastler.com/ask-dave. Either way will work. Until we next meet, seventy-three.